winds up in the fishbowl. Comdex in Las Vegas is probably the world's flashiest computer show, and it's often the launching pad for some of the industry's most innovative new products. But the showbiz package doesn't tell you much about what's inside. If you want to find out what's underneath the wrapping, stay tuned as we take you to Las Vegas Comdex 87 on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by CompuServe, featuring an online reference library, Wall Street reports, at-home shopping, airline reservations, games, and hundreds of other services. CompuServe, helping people get the most from computers. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover developments in computer technology worldwide. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and sitting in for Gary Kildall this week is George Morrow. George, we're taking a look at the floor of the Las Vegas Convention Center, the Comdex show. We hear so much about Comdex, and the 87 Comdex was the biggest one ever, the most exhibitors, the most people in the hallways. What really does go on there? Is there buying and selling taking place, or is it just PR and gawking? I don't think it's either, Stuart. It's, certainly it's a social event. But it's really a networking event more than anything else, where you get a chance to see everything that's happening, that has happened and probably will be happening for at least a little while. Mm -hmm. You get a chance to renew your acquaintanceship with everybody in the industry. You get a chance to look that guy mm -hmm. right in the eye who you're going to buy those Winchesters from and find out just how good they really are. It's something that I couldn't miss and whenever I ch get a chance I sure want to be a part of. George, we're going to take a look at Fall Comdex. We'll see the newest and most impressive products, hardware and software that came out of the show, and we'll try to find out what Comdex told us about the current state of the personal computer business. So let's go to the Las Vegas convention floor for Comdex Fall 87. Fall 87 was the biggest Comdex show ever with over 1,500 exhibitors and 100,000 visitors swarming through the convention center, the hotels, and the streets of Las Vegas in what has become a yearly invasion of high-tech buyers and sellers. Apple Computer was there, although it has shunned Comdex in the past. Apple had no earth-shattering introductions, but their showroom was constantly alive with curious crowds. Big Blue occupied its traditionally vast floor space and took the opportunity to announce a December 1st shipping date for its OS2 operating system. IBM's PS2 line of machines was indirectly the focus of attention as industry observers speculated on who would be the first to introduce compatible chipsets and motherboards. While several manufacturers offered compatible plug-in cards for the PS2 line, few were willing to commit themselves to more than vague predictions. Several reasons. One, this is a very complicated product to clone, and it's taking people longer than they expect. The BIOS is very large in this machine, and there's approximately 70,000 gates of IBM design logic on the motherboard. Number two reason I would see is that the PS2 marketplace hasn't grown real significantly. I would expect it to take three years before PS2 actually dominates the marketplace in terms of volume. Just below the surface of any discussion about microchannel architecture and PS2 clones are the legal issues. No one wants to be sued by IBM. We have contacted IBM and had several discussions with this and it does not seem to be a major problem at all from a licensing agreement. IBM has maintained in the past, we believe they will maintain a fair policy of licensing all of their utility patents. We feel, however, that they will probably be very onerous about their copyright issues within the BIOS. There's always concern when you deal with IBM. They have more corporate attorneys than most companies have employees. Attempting to satisfy both IBM and clone users was AST Research, which demonstrated its 386 machine with smart slot architecture. 
AST claims that by sidestepping the CPU during data transfers, SmartSlot provides the multi-master functions of IBM's microchannel while remaining compatible with older AT machines. Potential PS2 clone makers pack the floor at the Western Digital booth where compatible motherboards for models 30, 50 and 60 were on display. Western doesn't have a firm release date for the boards yet, but claims 100% compatibility and originality. Uh, it has our own devices on it, of our own CoreLogic from our Faraday division, our VGA devices from Paradise, our hard disk controllers, our floppy disk controllers, and could also have added to it our networking products. Well, the people that are interested in it are the uh, OEM manufacturers, serious OEM manufacturers, uh, who will be bringing to market uh, PS2 type product uh, based on uh, IBM's PS2 and microchannel. Western's leap into the uncharted waters of PS2 compatibility is bound to attract the keen scrutiny of IBM's legal department. But Western Digital's president is confident. We never have and don't ever intend to, to use anyone's proprietary information. Never. Uh, IBM has certain patents we understand, although they're not saying which ones. Um, we will be happy in our processing uh, uh, discussions on licensing any of those patents. Right? Um, anything else that turns out to be IBM proprietary that we can't license, we don't copy. Nothing in our products are copied anyhow. PS2 add-ins and add-ons were widely introduced at the show, including some clever combinations of both. Rodime Systems introduced its Double Play, a 45 megabyte internal hard disk replacement for the Model 50. Intended for OEMs and dealers, the drive with an access time of only 28 milliseconds replaces the Model 50's standard but sluggish 20 megabyte drive. End users take note, Double Play is shipped with an interface card for the PS2 Model 25. For the 5 million PC owners who aren't quite ready to trade in their machines for PS2s or 386 systems, Intel introduced a 386 add-in board for under $1,000. Owners of 8-bit 8088 machines can increase the performance of their aging PCs by up to 10 times, according to Intel. The inboard 386 PC comes with one megabyte of RAM, along with utilities to speed up screen displays and hard disk performance. Inboard 386 PC is compatible with IBM, Tandy, and Compaq machines and will be available in January 1988. While it's easy to concentrate on the big names at Comdex, those with the largest booths, Comdex is packed with smaller players whose offerings can be just as interesting. For example, Dyna Computer of San Jose, California was ready to meet Intel head-on with a 386 motherboard replacement for PC owners. First of all, a plug-in card goes into the slot in your XT system. Okay, therefore, any I.O. is still going to be at the speed of that XT system, which, as we all know, is 4.77 megahertz. The other thing is, is occasionally the accelerator calls, uh, cards have to make calls to the BIOS, which in some circumstances can cause incompatibility problems, as we saw in the 286 accelerator cards. Our conversion is a true transformation of the system because we are replacing the full system board, which is really the heart of the computer. We're not just adding something in and, uh, con and doing an upgrade. This is a total conversion. Microtech was promoting its 300G model scanner as a big step forward for both desktop publishing and graphic arts. The MSF 300G, available in February 1988, can scan continuous tone photos while recognizing up to 256 shades of gray, about 16 times more than first generation machines. What that means to the user is uh, really two different things. One, we can take all of that gray level information per each dot and send it out to a very high resolution uh, output device such as a Linotronics. And we allow the PostScript software that resides in a Linotronics to actually interpolate these 300 dots with all this grayscale information we're sending it and interpolate it to drive the Linotronics at its full output, which in the case of the L300 is 2,540 dots per inch. So what we get is really truly a publication quality output 
That's one benefit of it. The second benefit is we can take this information, this grayscale information, after we scanned it. Because we capture so much gray, 256 shades of gray, we can use some very sophisticated graphics editing programs that will let us actually manipulate the shades of gray. Also of interest to desktop publishers, QMS, best known for its laser printers, unveiled a color thermal transfer printer featuring 300 dots per inch resolution and a choice of three or four color ribbons. At one to two minutes per page, the $17,000 Color Graphics 100 is no speed demon, at least in comparison to laser printers, but compared to color pen plotters and inkjet printers, its output seems lightning fast. For computer owners looking for more conventional laser printers, Kyocera offered programmable IC cards that can store up to 512 kilobytes of data, everything from business forms to logos and signatures. The cards, costing about $55 each, are programmed on a PC card-based IC burner. The information is downloaded through a similar slot in the laser printer. The entire system, hardware and software, sells for about $800. Local area networks got a big boost at the show, aided by fiber optics and cellular transmission. Sun River Corporation demonstrated its 386-based fiber optic LAN. Sun River's Cigna system relies on 386-based workstations to transmit data over a fiber optic link at 32 megabits per second. The system provides fully bitmapped graphics and it transmits data at several hundred times the rate of conventional networks. Raynet Corporation introduced a different approach to connecting terminals by eliminating cables altogether. Raylan is a wireless local area network consisting of a PC adapter board, a receiver transmitter, and Novell compatible software. Raylan will cost about $2,000 per node and will be available in January 1988. Modems also got a boost from cellular technology. Omnitel unveiled a 1200 to 2400 baud modem on a chip for connecting laptops to cellular telephones. What we're doing is that we're using off-the-shelf microprocessors. Uh, you know, for a, take the case of a 2400 bits per second modem, basically we have two processors. One is the microcontroller, and the other one is the uh, uh, digital signal processor. And with those two chips, we're able to implement the whole modem. Coming up in just a moment, Wendy Woods with a report on laptops, new software, and more as we continue our special Comdex coverage. is already being called the year of the laptop and here at Comdex there are at least 14 companies displaying new ones. Some pack the power of yesterday's mainframes and run on Intel's powerful new microprocessor, the 80386. Grid has one that actually runs on batteries, but probably the most well-known name is Toshiba. At 15 pounds, the Toshiba T5100 is considered the lightest and most powerful laptop available. It whips along at a speedy 20 megahertz, has 2 megabytes of memory, a 40 megabyte hard disk, but a steep price, $6,500. And the biggest question is, who would buy it? I think that uh, it's a question of uh, what are the limits of your imagination as to what applications can be found in business. In our own headquarters in Irvine, California, we take the uh, computer to the work rather than bringing the work to the computer. Every meeting that I'm in, for example, we have products similar to that, very powerful products that uh, exercise the uh, financial spreadsheet right in the meeting so that we can make decisions at the meeting and plug it into a printer afterwards and have the product finished uh, right at the uh, conclusion of the meeting. If that much power boggles the mind and the wallet, Amstrad has relief. This British company is offering one of the lowest priced portables, ranging from $800 to $1,100. These XT compatibles have several unique features. We have some features that have, that's not been seen in, uh, in the portable market before, and, and those are a full-size AT-style keyboard, which, which is laid out. And it's a reason that the portable is as wide as it is, because it does have the full-size keyboard. It also has the feature of using flashlight batteries, regular flashlight batteries off the shelf that have an eight-hour lifetime. 
wearables are getting more versatile, and so is software. Sharp Electronics is offering to put your custom software directly into the chips inside its portable. While these so-called EEPROMs are created only for corporate customers, the service does offer some big advantages. When the program is brought up onto the screen, it's very fast, it's working at memory speeds, it's not subject to any mechanical fa failure that you'd have with a, a floppy disk, and it's very economical. Speaking of economics, Atari, known for its low-priced, high-value machines, brought a bevy of new products, new PCs, including an 80386-based machine, a CD-ROM player for the Atari Mega Series, and most importantly, a new kind of computer, the ABAC Transputer. With the transputer technology, you can actually plug in many microprocessor chips, have them operating in parallel with each other on one project. Each one can have its own bank of memory, and they're communicating over a very high-speed uh, serial interface internally, uh, which means that not only is a single transputer chip very fast, it's something like seven times faster than the chipset used in the Mac 2, but you can have many, many, um, we can get up to thousands of transputer chips linked into the one machine working on one program to have tremendous computing power on the desktop or in the office. Shipments of the transputer are scheduled for mid-1988. There were at least two new kinds of software, Lotus's Agenda, a personal database, easiest described as hypercard for the PC without sound and pictures. And Aldis showed Snapshot, PC software which allows a picture taken from any video source to be edited, placed into PageMaker, or made into a camera-ready halftone on a laser printer. Snapshot will cost $500 and ship in the first quarter of 1988. In Las Vegas for the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods. That's really interesting. With us in the studio now is Jan Lewis, president of the Lewis Research Corporation, and next to Jan, Tim Bahar, an executive vice president of the microcomputer group at Creative Strategies. George. Tim, now you've had a chance to digest everything at Comdex. Let us hear some of your thoughts. Well, obviously, it's, this was one of the largest shows that uh, Comdex has ever had. Yes. Uh, and it's an interesting thing in that the, er, when we went to Comdex last uh, November, uh -huh. the industry was in still a part of a downturn. And they That's were right. like, they expected maybe 80,000. They had maybe, if they were lucky, 70, 80. This show, by all means, you could tell the industry is thriving again because there were more people, more cab lines. Uh, more exhibitors. You got it. It was just amazing. Everything was full. The two key issues that I think probably we saw was the area of graphics, more and more things in the area of graphics, all the way from color output devices to Fax bigger bars. screens. Well, f the fax cards, I think, actually come into the area of communications, where mm -hmm. you start seeing this whole area of networking. You know, every year we go to Comdex, and it's another year of the land. Right. And we're getting closer well, to the year of the land. Closer, right. <laughs> but uh, the whole issue of, of graphics and communications were real big th uh, themes. The other thing that I think was amazing is the fact that we saw so many new laptops. Yeah. I counted probably 20 new laptops mm -hmm. introduced at this particular show. Yeah, and I think more importantly, the processors and the mass storage on the laptops, as well as the memory and all the yeah, functionality on the laptops. Disks, finally, hard disks. Yeah. And the screens. The screens well, are. But not yeah. just hard disks. If you look at the new introduction mm -hmm. from Toshiba with the Model 1000 that has a one megabyte card, RAM card that goes in there, that in essence does away with the need for a 20 right. meg yeah. or at least software yeah. and ROM. And, and I've been a proponent of software and ROM for so long, but when I saw this particular new RAM card being sl sl slid into a Model 1000, then I realized that I could download any software I want, mm -hmm. and instead of where you have a problem in ROM, of burning right, right. it, you can change that software with the new upgrade anytime you want. Well, mm -hmm. I wish they'd mm -hmm. make it where the battery would come out of that thing. <laughs> <laughs> what, Tim, what about laser printers? What did you see there? Well, there's probably three major issues that we saw in laser printers. First of all, we saw the first under 1,000 laser printers. Yeah. And that was the a, a magic number for us in the industry. And even mm -hmm. though they're dumb printers, they're ASCII printers, still right. we broke laser the 1,000. Laser groundwork for under 1,000 full. Absolutely. And for the average person being able to afford a laser printer yeah. of their own. Yeah. The other thing that right. we saw introduced here very uh, significantly was Toshiba showed the first clone, PostScript clone. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that particular printer I think is going to have a great impact on the market because whereas you've only had PostScript machines from Adobe and Apple and Wang and DEC, etc., we're now seeing some of the Japanese come in, but not with Adobe specifically, clones. instead of with the clone. The clones. And that signals a very yeah. significant change. That's going to be a very significant change, I think, all the way around. <clears throat> Adobe has been charging very, very high prices for PostScript. 
postscript. And since they sell it to the manufacturers of the printers or the computers, it gets marked up three to four times mm -hmm. by the time the end user buys it. Now, it's been really all along, it's been begging for somebody to come in and to do clones of postscript because of the fact that the uh, prices were so mm -hmm. high. So I think it's very, very encouraging that uh, the clones are coming in and they will dramatically bring down the cost, not only of laser printers, as Tim pointed out, but of postscript laser mm -hmm. printers. Yeah, well, when those full function printers eventually hit $1,000, I think there's going to be an explosion in that marketplace, <laughs> the likes of which we haven't seen that since haven't the VCRs. Seen. Yeah, you so, know, if you take a look, for instance, just to give one example of that laser printer, the, the engines fundamentally of those laser printers are photocopy engines. Sure. Now look at Canon with Jack Klugman on television, That's hawking right. these units for $600. <laughs> Once Postscript comes down in price, you'll have Postscript That's printers right. yeah. for $600. It's right. going to be a consumer it's item, basically. It's going to completely change the printer industry. Yeah. Tim, yeah. another area, the Intel 386 card at Comdex. Yeah, that, that's a fascinating one. Um, many people who, who are out there with the millions of 8088 uh, base PCs have been wondering whether they should buy a 286 card or throw the whole thing out and buy a 386. Mm -hmm. Well, Intel now has offered a new device that is basically a 386 card. And you go into a standard 8088 box, pull out that 8088 chip, and have a jumper that goes from that chip socket into the card, and for $995, you've got a 386 box, 16 megahertz if, AT. If you've mm -hmm. got an empty socket, <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although I would throw out some of my cards. Yeah, right. <laughs> I would throw out yeah. my communications but, cards to get yeah. this so one. What's your prognosis on board manufacturers coming with replacement boards that will be able to meet that price point? Um, I'll tell you, an Intel being the major supplier there is going to have a, a nice little hold on it. You don't um, think they'll sell to these fellas? Well, I'm sure they're going to sell, but the price points, depending on the quantities, is going to make the difference. But at $9.95, you're going to have a hard time beating that one. Well, but the overhead for Intel versus a lot of these smaller operations should almost make up the difference in that area, wouldn't you think? No, I don't think so. No. I think, I, uh, again, Intel well, we'll holds see. the chips. Yeah, I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure I agree. I think Intel has so much invested in pushing chips out the door, as well as the boards that I think, as you said, the overhead of a big corporation is going to sort of cancel out the fact that um, there's another layer once they well, sell the chips. Well, it'll be interesting. Yeah. Certainly yeah. it's yeah. going to change the yeah. equations on these aging yeah. machines. The, yeah. only, the only reason there may, may not be that inequity is that the PCEO group in, in uh, uh, Oregon uh -huh. is a totally uh -huh. yeah. separate divi yeah. division, yeah. and therefore their P&Ls and everything else is much less. Yeah. Uh -huh. Jan, anything uh -huh. new on in software, operating systems, OS2, and so on? Well, I'll tell you, that was the major area of confusion, you might say, at the show. And if you right. caught my panel on OS2, I mean, that just sort of underscored the confusion. You've got IBM and Microsoft saying it's going <laughs> to conquer the world. Yes. You've got um, software developers that really well, have a tremendous decision as to, I mean, they're sweating bullets in terms of what to put into into. Mm -hmm. They don't even know what's going to be there. They don't know. And the interesting thing that I find is f with the large corporations, the Fortune 500, let's say, is that whereas two years ago they said, well, yes, we're going to move in OS2 direction because IBM right. says it. Now two years have passed and there's a lot of confusion and they're saying we're going to wait and see. Yeah. And in fact, we're going to convert most of our machines to 386s yeah. via either the board but, or some other solution. But this is solution. typical. Markets and confusion, markets very wait and see. More so than usual. Yeah. And this in fact, yeah, this time, however, usually when you have confusion, you have wait and see. Mm -hmm. and you know what's happened this time? There was initial wait and see, but then people got tired of waiting and seeing, and, and they went out and bought Compaq. Yeah. That's right. Compaq has yeah. come out uh, really smelling nicely. Major beneficiary of this. I'm Major sorry. beneficiary. Guys, we're out of time. <laughs> Jen, Tim, thank you very much. That's our look at Comdex Fall 87. Hope we'll see you again next week. In the random access file this week, in the aftermath of Comdex, several computer industry analysts are saying next year's most important development will be the growth of optical storage. Microsoft is predicting sales of over 100,000 CD-ROM drives in 1988, and they're also predicting a rush of new CD-ROM software applications later next year. The optimism comes from the announcement by several manufacturers of new CD-ROM drives for under $700, among them Atari, Sanyo, Amdex, Sony, and Hitachi. And General Electric has just announced it's getting into the optical business with DVI, or Digital Video Interactive Technology. GE's DVI system will let you store and retrieve video, music, text, and data from the same compact disc. 
Amidst all the optimism and occasional confusion regarding the OS2 operating system, there's also now criticism. The president of WordPerfect says the industry is rushing ahead into new operating systems while users are still having trouble using the old one. Pete Peterson says what users really want is smaller, easier to use computers, not more confusion. He said the cost of OS2 and the additional memory and other add-ons needed to run it will be so high that few users will benefit. With all the talk of OS2 and the new 286 and 386 CPUs, what about the 10 million PC owners who still have 8088-based machines? Well, the president of Quarterdeck says there's no need to throw your PC away and buy a new machine. Teresa Myers predicts sales of $100 million next year in upgrade products that turn a basic PC into a faster and more powerful machine capable of handling new power-hungry applications. And says Myers, while there's a lot of talk about 386 machines, the technical sizzle is still not matched by practical applications. If you want to move to high-powered desktop publishing software but are afraid your aging PC XT can't handle it, computer pioneer Lee Felsenstein says not to worry. He says you don't have to buy a 386 machine or a Macintosh. His new product, called Nomax, gives you a 386 coprocessor, a high-resolution monitor, and a multifunction I.O. channel with 4 megabytes of RAM. It runs under Microsoft Windows and sells for under $4,000. Time for this week's software review with Paul Schindler. Red Queen on Red King, right? Well, you know, you can cheat at solitaire on the table, but you can't cheat when you play it on the computer. That's the appeal and the disadvantage of programs like Klondike 3.0. There are games with color and fancier sound effects, but there are none with better graphics thanks to the Apple Macintosh. You can play a number of variations on the basic game, including a casino version. Sound is optional. If you leave it on, the program plays the theme from the movie The Sting. You can play with four different people. The computer scores your solitaire playing, depending on how fast you are, and keeps track of the 10 highest scores. That makes Klondike quick moving and interesting, unlike real solitaire. Plus, it's harder to lose your Mac than your deck of cards. You'll never play solitaire with a deck of 51 if you have Klondike 3.0 for the Apple Macintosh, just $10 from Computing Capabilities Corporation of Mountain View, California. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Paul Schindler. As fax cards and fax machines continue to grow, so does the problem of fax junk mail. The problem with fax junk mail is that you, the fax machine owner, have to pay for the fax paper while the junk mail is being sent. Some mail order houses are now using sophisticated fax software to send three-page ads each week to a database of potential customers. Some users are urging legislation to prevent unsolicited fax mail. Finally, the U.S. Department of Agriculture reports an unusual problem with its project to develop robot fruit pickers. The robot harvesters were equipped with black and white image scanners in an effort to save time and money, but it turns out that to a robot, an orange has the same size, shape, and brightness as a small cloud, so that robot pickers are often hung up reaching for the clouds and trying to pick them. The USDA says it's back to the drawing board, this time using color. That's it for this week's Chronicles. We'll see you next time. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by CompuServe, featuring an online reference library, Wall Street reports, at-home shopping, airline reservations, games, and hundreds of other services. CompuServe, helping people get the most from computers. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover developments in computer technology worldwide.